All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this highly anticipated FAFSA line by line walkthrough for counselors. So we are about a month away from the FAFSA's opening date. FSA has recently told us in the last couple of weeks that the FAFSA's effective opening date is December 3rd. But if you happen to see it online before then, then it's live. So the FAFSA will be open and running, ready to go and live by December 31st. Today's line by line walkthrough session is just for counselors and college access professionals, but I do want to let you know that we will be hosting a session specifically for students and families in January, specifically on January 9th. Um, and we will be sending out information to you all and to students and families about that shortly. I am Jenny Johnson. I'm the outreach manager at NCSEAA. And before we get started, I want to just tell you a little bit about um, the, uh, excuse me, assistance authority. So today, we want you to ask as many questions as possible, share what you're learning on social media using the hashtag CFNC, and we do want to let you know that the recording is going to be available in the next day or so. Uh, we'll make the recording and the slide deck available. So again, ask all the questions that you'd like. We are going to use the Q&A rather than the chat for your questions, so please use the Q&A. We'll turn the chat off in just a moment. Um, and then lastly, uh, we will make the recording available. If you weren't able to attend today's session, but you registered, you will get the slides. So just a little bit about the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. We are the state agency that helps North Carolina students plan and pay for their education. We're pleased to bring you the CFNC.org website where you can go for everything you need to know about the college going process. So we have information about college and career exploration. Students can fill out college applications there. They can have their transcripts sent to North Carolina um, institutions. The residency determination service um, is, is um, filtered through the CFNC website. We have FAFSA resources, a wonderful local scholarship portal. You can find information about loans and information about the 529 savings plan. So if you're not using CFNC regularly, CFNC.org, excuse me, then we encourage you to do that. And while we're talking about things brought to you by the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority and FAFSA completion, I want to talk to you and present to some of you FAFSA Day. So if you've been in working as a school counselor in North Carolina for a while, then you're familiar with FAFSA Day. But if you're not, I'll tell you about it briefly. FAFSA Day is a um, statewide event where students and families, adult learners can go and get FAFSA help from um, FAFSA, excuse me, financial aid professionals throughout the state. So every Orange County that you see listed is hosting a FAFSA Day event on January 27th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And our presenter today, Dr. Sean Weathers, is hosting an event at Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte as well. So if you don't see your county lit up in orange and you're wondering what's going on, feel free to reach out to the community college or the, the four-year institution in that area and ask them, are they participating in FAFSA Day? We're going to be sending you all marketing information that you can share with your students. We'll have social media, a social media campaign as well, because we want students and families to get all of the help that they need, especially given the changes to this year's FAFSA. So again, FAFSA Day is statewide. It's happening on January 27th uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at all of the locations that you see numbered on the screen in the Orange counties that are represented. So without further ado, I want to introduce you all to Dr. Sean Weathers. She's the Director of Student Financial Aid at Central Piedmont Community College, and she is going to be uh, presenting to us today the, the line by line walkthrough of the FAFSA. Take it away, Dr. Weathers. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, OK, let me share. Can you see my screen? Hey, good morning, everybody. I will begin the line by line form preview presentation. So some of the topics that we will go over, um, we're gonna do the overview and then you'll see some examples where the dependent student will invite a parent, um, where the parent will start and submit a FAFSA form without the student's consent. Um, you will see a summary of the FAFSA submission 
um, and some information about the dependent student direct unsubsidized loan opportunity and the provisional independent status. Student, I'm sorry. Um, so some of the overviews um, with this presentation is gonna provide some screenshots um, that you can use as a guide for the 2425 FAFSA form. Um, the screenshots are intended to show what the form would look like and present a majority of the questions displayed on the FAFSA. Um, some of the screenshots are still currently unavailable, as many of you know, a lot of stuff is unavailable for 2425. Um, however, they should be available in a future preview uh, presentation, which is scheduled for sometime in December. Um, and as Jenny has already mentioned, the version of the 2425 should be available for students by December 31st, but if you see it live before then, you will be able to apply. Um, some of the major changes, um, everybody has to have an FSA ID. That is your account username and password. It is required to access the FAFSA form. Um, there is an ability for uh, users without a social security number that can create a FAFSA ID and still access the form. That is going to be the knowledge-based questionnaire for those students or users. Um, there have been roles identified for the FAFSA form. So some of the roles will be student, that is the applicant, parent, and a preparer. And once all the required data has been provided and all sections have been signed, any role can submit the FAFSA form. Um, some new terms, the introduction of contributors to the FAFSA. So who was a contributor, a parent, another um, your other parent or step parent, student spouse, student when invited by the parent or preparer. Um, contributors must provide the required information and sign their respective section for the FAFSA form to be considered complete. And then the FAFSA onboarding experience um, for initial entry and correction entry. So it'll, it'll kind of show you different onboarding screens that students will see. Some additional major changes is the integration of the FAFSA form into the student government's uh, studentaid.gov's dashboard, the status center, the notification center. The overall look and feel of the FAFSA form has changed. Um, the integration of the data direct um, the direct data exchange for IRS, so no longer the IRS uh, data retrieval tool. Um, the elimination of the expected family contribution, EFC, with the student aid index. Uh, the required consent from users to retrieve the FTI, your federal tax information, to be eligible for the student aid and to be eligible to receive your student aid index. Uh, and I think uh, the predictive search results for questions that require city, state, and school lookup. So an easier way to search for the schools um, that students would like to add to the application. Some of the key features um, on the FAFSA form um, that the students, parents, and preparers may begin, complete, and submit a new FAFSA for the, um, for the 24 25 processing cycle. Uh, dependent students must invite their parents to contribute to the form. Uh, dependent student parent must invite their spouse to contribute to the student's form. Student and contributors must provide consent. So consent is the common denominator. Everybody must provide consent to disclose information to be eligible for federal student aid. Finally, um, students and parents may be eligible to transfer their um, information um, into a state aid application. Of course, North Carolina is not part of them, but you can see the participating states. Um, students no longer need to take an additional action to start the renewal FAFSA application. And after the FAFSA form is processed, students can correct or update their application um, as we've done in the past. However, contributors are only able to correct or update their sections of the student's application. So they will no longer have access to see the entirety of the form, only their section. So let's start with the screens. Um, so in this example, this is a dependent student that is inviting a parent. <clears throat> so when the student logs in, they'll see this landing page. Looks a little bit different, but on this page, they're directed to start a new form or edit an existing form. So for this example, the student will begin a new application. Um, then it's going to bring us to our login for uh, your FSA ID. Um, if they need to create an FSA ID, uh, FSA ID, they can do so on this page, but for this purpose, we already have one. Um, then this is where you identify your role. Who is completing this application? So for us, we are the student. We're going to complete it. Then we get the onboarding pages. Um, there are four of these. Um, this will only be available the first time they are taken through the FAFSA process. So the first page gives them an overview of what the FAFSA is. 
Um, the second one defines what the contributors are since they are these are new terms for the new year. Um, so it identifies who a parent or a spouse is and how to invite them and who, may, who they need to fill out the form and any documents they may need. The third one is what to expect. Um, it gives them an estimated hour to complete the application. Um, we've all found this screen to be so funny because it's never taken us an hour to do it, but it does give them an expectation of an hour to finish it. And then it gives them information about after submitting the FAFSA um, and the next steps, what they will see on their FAFSA submission summary. Then we're directed to the student's identity information. Again, this is information that's pulled directly from their FSA ID. So if there's any edits to this, it must be done via studentaid.gov in the account settings. You will not be able to edit this section in the FAFSA. However, you are able to edit the mailing address, the city and state. Then you're asked to enter the dependent student's um, state of legal residence. And then we get to the infamous consent page. Um, so for this purpose, we will be approving the consent. Um, but on this page, it just gives you a lot of terms and conditions about what consent means. Um, continued. And so we're going to mark that we're going to approve our consent. Then we are directed to our personal circumstances. So it's gonna ask us about if we're married, single, and you notice on the new application, um, divorce separated is marked as two different options. Um, so you would need to check whichever one. Then it asks about our career or college plans. Um, so for this example, we're gonna be a first year student and we have not earned our first bachelor's degree for 24-25. Um, then we're directed to our student personal circumstances. What we also know this as the appendice questions. And so we're gonna say none of these apply, but this is where the student is able to say if they are a veteran, um, if they um, are an orphan or a ward of the court or in foster care. So we're going to say no to this because we're a dependent student living at home. Um, and then it brings us to our student other circumstances. So it asks us about if we are an unaccompanied minor. If you notice, this is a separate question than what was on the dependency or personal circumstances. This is now a separate um, question. And so if a student was to select yes to this, it would give them the independent um, provisional status. And we'll talk about that at the very end of the presentation. Um, but for this example, we're going to say no. And then the other um, question that's new on here is the student's unusual circumstance. So it automatically asks if there's some type of abandonment or abusive home life or threatening environment um, where they cannot provide the parent's information. Um, so a student can select yes. Again, if they were selecting yes to this particular question, it would give them the independent um, provisional status. But for this example, we're gonna say no. Um, this is also kind of new on the application. Um, if the parents are unwilling to provide the information, the student can go ahead and select to have a financial aid administrator determine the eligibility for a direct unsubsidized loan, only if the school is participating in this, of course. Um, and we'll talk about this slide a little later as well. Um, again, for this example, we're going to say no to this question because my parent is going to provide their information. Now it goes to asking me questions about my parent. Um, are my parents married to each other? Because this is where it's going to ask me about um, inviting my parents. Um, and so here's what the invitation screen looks like. The student is asked to enter personal information about the parents in order to send the invitation to the FAFSA. Um, and in this scenario, I'm only inviting one parent. So I'm going to put in my mom's name and I don't have her social, but I do have her email. So you do not have to have their social. If you have it, that's fine. But if the student doesn't have the social, that's completely fine. You will still be able to send the invitation. Once that's sent, it's going to take me back to my student demographics. Um, and so it's going to give me an overview of what that means, what I'm going to be asked for. 
And the demographic section is basically research only. So a student can prefer not to answer these questions. Um, so for this example, I'm gonna prefer not to answer what my gender is. And if you see, there's a new question about is the student transgendered? Again, they don't have to answer this question. If they would like to, they can. For this example, I prefer not to answer. Um, with the student's race and ethnicity, again, research-based only questions, um, you can prefer not to answer. If your ethnicity or race is listed, you may select that, but for me, prefer not to answer. Um, continue with the race and ethnicity, you can prefer not to answer what your race is. I prefer not to answer, so I'm continuing. Then it takes me to my citizenship status. Um, I gonna, You can check if you're a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen or neither. And then click continue for this example, we are a U.S. citizen. Now it's asking me about my parents' educational status. So for this example, I'm gonna say that neither one of my parents attended college. Click continue. Then I'm asked about my parent killed in the line of duty. So this question is asking whether this, what a parent or um, whether the student's parent or guardian killed in the line of duty while serving active duty as a member of the armed forces after on or after September 11th. So for this example, I'm going to say no. Then I'm directed to my high school completion status. I will select that I have a high school diploma. And then I'm gonna enter my high school information. So I'm gonna enter the state and the city, and then I'm gonna click search. When I click search, it's gonna bring up the school for me to confirm, making sure that I enter the right information. If I need to edit this, I can click the edit, or I can go back to the previous section and start over. If the school is what I want, I will click continue. Then I'm going to my financial section. This provides an overview of what that means. Um, remembering that with this overview, there are limited financial sections once you provide the consent. So I'm gonna be asked about my um, amount of paid taxes on the college grant scholarships, AmeriCorps benefits, or any foreign tax income. So for this example, I don't have any of that, so I'm gonna make it zero. Then it goes to my assets. Um, and I'm going to enter that I made 500 or I have $500 in my cash checking or savings accounts, but I have no net worth businesses or um, investments. So now I'm going to my colleges. Where do I want to send this information to? Um, and so for this, these two, a couple of screens, you would enter the, the state um, and the school name, and then you would click search. Remembering in this section, you can enter up to 20 schools. And then the second screen is where you would select the schools if you are interested in that school. Then it'll give you a review of all of the schools that you selected. If you would like to find out more information about the school, you can click the view information button and it'll tell you um, if there is specific eligibility requirements for state aid. If not, um, you like the list, you can hit continue. If you would like to remove a school, you can do so on this page. Um, but we've entered up to 10 schools, so we're gonna continue. And then it's gonna give me my review page. So this is gonna be a review of everything that I have submitted thus far. Um, at this section, if I need to go in and edit anything, I would click on the expand all button, and then there will be a question hyperlink I can click on that hyperlink and it can take me to the corresponding page that I need to update. If everything is fine right here, um, I will continue on. Um, and if you see the parent signature on here, it'll be listed here as well. So this is telling me that I have sent my application to two parents, but in this example, we only sent it to one parent, um, but it's telling me the date that I sent it Now I need to sign. So it's giving me um, my information about what I have completed. This page confirms the terms and conditions. The FAFSA form is not considered complete and can't be processed because my parent has not provided their information yet. I've only sent them the invitation. So I will agree to the terms. 
and then I will submit. And then I will get my um, complete section, complete um, form. This is not your FAFSA submission form, but it's just going to give you an overview that, hey, you've done your portion, um, you've sent it to the parent. And so until the parent signs their application, you will not see any estimated aid. And this is just the second page of that confirmation. Saying once my application is complete, I'll be able to view it. Um, and so this is not a view in the FAFSA um, form. It just demonstrates a parent opening the FAFSA invitation. So if when my parent logs in, this is what they will see. That I have invited them to go in and submit their information on my FAFSA. So there are some next steps that they need to take. So once they click the login button, it's going to take the parent to the FSA ID login page. Parent would enter their information. If they need to create an FSA ID, they can do so on this page. And then as the parent, they will see this activity center. And so on this, it sees that the parent sees the invitation to be the contributor on the student's FAFSA. So it says, hello, you've been requested to be a contributor to um, Raya's FAFSA. And this is just information about what a parent's contributing to the FAFSA means. So this is only on the parent's page. Then they get the onboarding screens as well. They get four onboarding. They will only get this for the first time that they log into the system. Um, so the very first page is about what is the FAFSA form? So what are they expecting? What, what, why am I having to fill this form out? Why did my child send this to me? And it tells me what is a contributor again, as it told my student. Um, it tells me again what to expect and how long it's going to take me to fill out this application. And then the last one is going to tell me what the next steps after I submit this form. So I'm going to go ahead and start the form to begin the parent section. Again, we're back to the um, FSID page on here. Um, if a parent needs to edit this information, they can only do so in the account settings, just like the student. Um, however, they are able to update their mailing address through the FAFSA. Then it goes to me asking about providing consent. Um, it gives me the terms and conditions of the IRS and the federal tax information being transferred. It's continued on the next page. Again, if I don't consent, you know, I will not be eligible for financial aid. So, or my student wouldn't be eligible for financial aid. So I'm gonna go ahead and approve it in this example. And then it takes us to the demographics about the parent and an overview of what that means. So I am here gonna respond if I'm married or not married. Um, for this particular section, I'm gonna say that I'm married, but I'm not separated and I'm gonna click continue. I will put in my state of legal residence here and click continue. Then it's gonna take me to my financials, my financial section. Again, I'm gonna have limited number of tax information because I did provide consent to this application. So I click continue. And you see my questions are a little bit different. It's asking me about federal benefits, if I've received any federal benefits. Um, so I'm gonna say no to any of these. This question now asks, did or will the parent file a 2022 joint tax return with their current spouse? So I'm going to say yes. I'm, I'm filing a married or I've, I have filed a married filing jointly tax return. So I'll click continue. Then it's asked me about my family size. Now, remember, this information is pulled directly from the exemptions from your taxes. Um, and so you do have the ability to edit the family size on the application if it is different from what your exemptions are on the taxes. But for this purpose, everything is fine. So I'm going to hit continue. And then it's asking me for the number in college. How many of my children will be in college or how many children in my household? 
I am not including the parent in this particular example, um, which you never include the parent anyway, but this is just asking about the, the people in my family who will be in college. So I'll click continue. Um, now it's asking me about my tax information, um, about my earned income tax credit. So the same questions that you saw in the student section, it's asking for the parent here as well. Um, I, for, so for this purpose, I don't have any earned income tax credit and I have not filed any foreign income taxes or any um, taxes were paid for college grants, scholarships or AmeriCorps. So I'm gonna click continue. It's gonna take me to my assets question. For this particular example, I'm gonna put that I do have $10,000 in my cash savings or checking account. And I do have $5,000 in net worth of investments. So I've added that and I'm gonna click continue. Sorry, somebody's trying to call me. <clears throat> Then it asks me about my spouse, my um, partner's information. So I'm going to enter it here. I'm going to enter their name, their date of birth, um, their social, and their email. I'm only entering the email just in case I need to send them an invitation. And then I get my review page. So on my review page basically shows me what I've already completed. If I need to edit anything from these screens, I can click on the expand all button as I did with the student um, and then click on the questions hyperlink and then I can go to that corresponding page to edit. If everything is fine, I'm gonna continue on to the signature page to complete the application. So on this page, the parent acknowledges the terms and conditions. Since all the required sections are complete, the parent can sign um, and submit the student form. So I'm going to check that and sign and submit it. Um, then after I get this, I'm going to see this confirmation page. This page displays information about the tracking of the student's FAFSA and the next steps. The student will receive an email with the full detailed information. Again, I'm not receiving that information, but my student will. Um, and it'll say that the student and parent sections are now completed and the student should be able to see their um, FAFSA submission form. Okay, so in this next section, it's going to be about the parents starting the application, submitting the application without the student's consent or the signature. So we start off with the um, landing page. And then again, for this purpose, the parent is beginning the new application on behalf of their child. So for this purpose, watch the titles of the page to make sure you're putting in the right information. And I will highlight that. So the parent is logging in. So I'm using the parent FSA ID information. Again, if I need to edit anything, I can only do um, any edits on the studentaid.gov account settings. But if I have everything done, I'm gonna click com um, complete. Then after logging in, I'm gonna say, I'm starting this form as a parent. So I'm gonna click parent and continue. The parent is now asked to provide the student's information because the student hasn't started their application yet. So it doesn't know who my student is. So I'm gonna put in that information. Um, the student then can enter on the form and provide consent and sign the form to make any needed corrections after I put in this information. So this is just continued. This is the student's information continued. Again, we're gonna get those four onboarding screens because this is the first time we're submitting the application. Um, so the first one is gonna be about the overview of the FAFSA. The second one is gonna identify who the contributor is and what information or documents needed to complete the FAFSA. The third is what to expect, how long it's gonna take us to finish this application. And the final one is our final or next steps once you've submitted the application. Um, then we're going to go to the student's identity. Um, and so from this page, the student can verify that the personal information is correct. We need to make any changes. You need to go back to um, account settings. Enter the student's mailing address. If you need to edit anything, you can do that here on this. It's asking about the student's state of legal residence, not the parent. We're still entering the information about the student. So here I will put the student's legal residence. And then now I'm going to the student's personal circumstance or the student's dependency questions. And then I will click continue. 
It's going to ask me if the student is married. So for this example, they were never married. And I'll click continue. Um, the, it's going to ask about the career college plan. So for this example, I'm going to put that my child is a first year freshman. And no, they will not have their bachelor's degree for the 24-25 school year. Click continue. And then the student's personal circumstances. So the, those, those infamous dependency questions. So because my student doesn't participate or have any of those um, items, I'm going to select none and click continue. <clears throat> then ask me about the other circumstances. Is the student considered an unaccompanied homeless? I'm going to say no in this example. Remember, if I would say yes, then there would be an, an independent provisional, but I'm saying no. And then the additional dependency override question is what we call this um, for unusual circumstances where there's an abandonment or um, left home due to an abusive or threatening environment. So I'm gonna say no to this example. Then I get the question about if I want to um, go ahead and I'm omitting my parents' information or my parents doesn't wanna complete their portion. Do I want a financial aid administrator to go ahead and determine my eligibility for unsubsidized loan? Um, since I've provided my information, I'm gonna say no for this example. Now it's taking me to the parent's information. Um, so I think it's very important to when you're filling this out is to see in the titles of who information you're putting on here. So now that I'm at the parent's information, I'm just gonna verify that my um, information is correct, which it should be is for my FSA ID. I'm gonna enter my mailing address. I'm gonna provide consent to this application. Um, so I want my information directly transferred from the IRS. So I'm going to read all of my legal guard, um, jargon, and then I'm going to say approved. Then it's going to ask me about my demographics. So what is my current mar marital status? I'm single. I'm going to click continue. It's going to ask me to enter my legal state of residence. So I'm going to put that and continue. Now I'm going to my parent um, financial section. Again, limited questions because I've already provided consent. So I'm gonna click continue. It asks me about my federal benefits. I did not receive any federal benefits in the year 2022 or 2023. So I'm gonna say none of these apply. Click continue. I'm gonna enter my family size. If um, is the parent size was well, asking me, is the parent size different from the number of individuals came on my taxes? I'm saying no, because it's going to pull information um, from my tax information. So no. And then it's asking me how many people will be in college, excluding the parent. So I'm just going to put my one child that's in college. Continue. Um, and then the two questions about your earned income tax credit and any taxes paid on the scholarship of America Corps. So both of those, no and zero. So I'm going to click continue. Um, I'm entering the same assets that I did on the first example. So 10000 for cash check on savings. And then my net worth of investments, 5000 So I'll click continue. And then I get my review page. So I've completed the personal identifiers, the demographics, and the financials. If I need to go back and edit, click expand all, and then click the hyperlink to go back to that corresponding page to edit. If not, I'm going to click continue to the signature page. Now on this page, the parent is acknowledging their terms and conditions. Um, after agreeing and I sign this, the parent is able to submit only my section. However, the student section is still incomplete because the FAFSA form cannot be completed because they haven't went in and consented to anything. So I'm going to sign and submit. Um, there is no screenshot of this page, but on this um, screen, the next screen, when the parent does sign off, it's going to give them an information about next steps. Um, and then the it's going to remind the parent um, that the form is not complete because the student hasn't provided their information. Um, and so for this scenario, we're going to select to provide the student information manually and enter the student section. So the next screen is going to be that. So it's going to ask us about the student's um, demographics. It will tell us what the demographics is. 
um, what to look out for. And then we're going to enter that demographic information. Again, this is research based only stuff. This is not used to disqualify or qualify any student for aid. So if you prefer not to answer those questions, you can click prefer not to answer or you can put their gender. Um, same thing with the race and ethnicity. Um, and then we're directed to the citizenship status. So we're going to say that my student is a U.S. citizen or national. And then it's asking me about my education status. So I'm going to say no, neither one of the parents attended college in this example. So no, click continue. Then I'm asked about if the parent was killed in the line of duty. For this example, I'm going to say no. Then I'm asked about the high school completion status for the student. The student did complete high school, so I'm going to say high school and click continue. Then I'm asked to enter that high school information. So again, click the state, I mean, enter the state, um, well, click the state and then enter the city, click search, and then you will be given the information to confirm that that is the right school. If it is the right school, you will click continue. If not, you have the option to edit or go back to the previous se section to search for a new school. Now it's going to the student's financials because the student has not provided consent, of course. Um, so it tells them what, what we're asking for in this section. So click continue. It's gonna ask me if my student will file a tax return for 2022. So I'm gonna say yes, they are gonna file. Click continue. Again, this is not a screenshot available, but since the student hasn't provided their consent, um, the parent would be, ha would be asked to manually enter this information. So the parent enters a response and entry in each field. So it'll ask about um, all of the tax information, like the wages and all of that. Um, and then it'll give us to the student assets. So for this example, the student has a $500 um, balance in the cash and savings and check-ins account. So we're going to enter that and zero for net worth of businesses and investments. So zero. Then we're going to go to the college section and enter their um, colleges that they would like to enter. Uh, up to 20 schools again. We've already went over this. Um, they put in the schools. You'll click search to confirm. It'll give a list of the schools that you selected. Make sure you hit the green check, I mean the green plus to say you're selecting the schools. Click continue, and then it'll give you a list of those schools. If you need to view information about those specific schools, if there is some um, eligibility requirements for additional aid, it'll be in that view info. If you want to remove those schools, you can click remove. But if you're fine with that, you would just click continue. Then this gives me a review of what we've filled out thus far. If I need to edit anything, click the expand all, go to the question hyperlink, and it'll take me to that corresponding page to edit. Again, the parent cannot provide a signature for the student. So I can fill out everything, but I cannot provide the consent. Um, so I get to the signature, um, well, the section complete page, and this page displays information about next steps. But because I'm missing the student's consent and the signature is missing, right now they're currently ineligible for anything. The student will still have to go in and provide the consent. Um, so this section just gives you an overview of the FAFSA submission summary. Um, so the student will receive this once their application has been processed. Um, and any subsequent corrections that they submit. And so it's broken down into two, um, four different tabs. There's an eligibility overview, there's a FAFSA form answers, there's school information and next steps. So at the very top, the student will see information about when their form was received and processed. They also have the option to print this to keep for their records. So in the eligibility overview tab, it gives them an estimate of what their aid would be. And this includes any federal, um, any federal aid and any loan or work study. So the final determination of the student's financial eligibility is provided by the school. 
And I think it yeah, it says that at the very bottom. So keep this in mind that this is only an estimate. I do like the, the highlight of that. This is only an estimate. So they do need to see that the, the final confirmation will come from the school. Um, it also tells them what their student aid index. They will only see this if everything has been consented from parent and student. And then you can click, what does this mean on this eligibility overview? And the FAFSA form answers, this tab, the student sees the answers that they um, and their contributor have provided on the FAFSA form. If any of the answers are incorrect, they can choose to do a correction. So the same um, as they were in the application, they can click the expand all and click on the um, question hyperlink and it'll take them to that corresponding page. And this is just the FAFSA answers completed. So just, um, this is like the SAR basically, student A report. Um, and then it shows the school information. It shows that the schools that you were selected um, on the application that you would like to send it to. So it shows their graduation rate, their retention rate, the transfer rate, the default rate, the, the debt upon completion, um, and the average cost to attend the school. So this is very important for uh, students if they are trying to figure out what school they want to choose. And then the final one is the next steps. On this tab, um, the student sees comments that pertain to the FAFSA form. Um, some comments may require the student to start a correction or send additional documentation to the school. Other comments may be informational and do not require any further action. Um, lastly, there's a more resources page. On the right side of the FAFSA, the student can see or choose from additional resources, including visiting aid summary or their college scorecard. So that is new as well. And earlier on in the presentation, I said we were gonna talk about um, how a dependent student, if the parent is unwilling to provide their information, how they can automatically send the information to the financial aid department to um, determine eligibility. That's what this section is. So if a parent of a dependent student are unwilling to provide their information, um, the student doesn't have an unusual circumstances, so they don't have a, any unusual circumstances. They can choose to have their school determine the eligibility for a direct unsubsidized loan. Um, and so this is only for those schools that participate in it. Not all schools participate in federal loans, community college. So like for Central Piedmont, this wouldn't be a determination factor for our students. Um, so it, this is contingent on the school that the student is selecting, but this is an option for those. And the provisional independent status, um, if the student, when we were at those sections about unaccompanied homeless or the dependency override, so if the student selects yes to these particular questions, they will get this drop down box um, and they must select all that apply. And so once that is done, the application is flagged as a independent provisional student and they do have to um, provide documentation at the school to determine if this is eligible, if they were eligible for this um, particular stance or not. And then the second one is for dependency override. So again, if a student states yes to this particular question, um, that they have left home or they're abandoned or estranged or victim of human trafficking, it will flag their application as an independent provisional status, and then it will be sent to the financial aid department to determine eligibility. So based on the answers provided to the student, um, they don't have to provide any parent information if they select yes to those questions. Um, the student is able to sign and submit the FAFSA form, but as I stated, it will not be verified until um, they turn in the information to the financial aid administrator of the school to review it, to, to give them an estimate of their federal aid eligibility. And that is it for the line by line FAFSA. So I'm going to stop sharing. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weathers, for giving us that information. I know that it was a lot and we're still learning information um, even as the weeks go by. So thank you for 
um, updating us on, uh, us on what we know now. We had a, uh, at least one question came in that we weren't sure of how to answer. And so I wanna pose that question to you if that's okay. So one participant asked, um, if a student can't provide a parent's information due to his or her parents living in a different country and the student has been living independently in the United States, how would they submit the FAFSA? So I, with the new FAFSA, I would say they would say yes to that. Um, not the, the abandonment question, so we can do a dependency override. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And folks, if you have other questions, please feel free um, to continue to put them in the Q&A. Um, I see a raised hand as well, so I am going to attempt to allow those folks to talk. We're going to start with you, Brianna. I see your, your hand is raised. And if you can go ahead and unmute, Brianna, we'll take your question. Sorry, I raised it by accident. Oh, okay. It's okay. No problem. All right. We're going to try Linda. Linda, I see your hand is raised. Yes, I have a question about when the parent completes the FAFSA uh, and the student hasn't given consent. So when the student logs in, do they have to complete all of the other information or is it just the consent that they provide? They would provide the consent and any information that's on the FAFSA. So some of the some of the questions they would still have to provide um, answers to, but they would have to still provide the consent as well. Okay, so they will have to complete some other information as well. One other question. Um, uh, on this new form, they in the student sections, they asked for uh, information about both parents. So the second parent was optional. So they decide which one is the contributor or if they put both parents there, which one gets the email? So in my example, um, I put that I would have married Fallon jointly. Um, so I didn't, I only had to put my spouse information because it was gonna pull the tax information for both of us. But if you provide that you're married Fallon separately, then you would have to go in detail and provide the other parent's information to invite them for their consent because their taxes will not automatically be pulled with mine because we did separate taxes. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to go to Linda, I mean, excuse me, Wanda now. Hi, um, I had asked, is there a place if a parent is deceased? Because I have a student, the biological father's deceased. Um, the stepmother's alive, but the student lives with the uncle. So the mm -hmm. uncle and grandparents provide financial report support, but nobody claims the student on his tax on their taxes. I know this is very complicated. The mother is still alive, but doesn't work and has not provided any financial support. But the student still needs to invite the biological mother, correct? Because I'm wondering if they might be a provisional independent student. Yes, you are correct. The student would still invite the biological mother um, and more than likely would probably qualify if the mother is not working. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. We've got a question here from Jesse as well. So I'm going to allow Jesse to ask their question. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, I work at the Boys and Girls Club, so we help a lot of families uh, with their FAFSA, and we have a lot of parents um, uh, who are uh, undocumented, um, whether or not um, the child is documented. What would that change uh, for the students um, if their uh, parents are not um willing to do that out of um, just fear. So the application will come through as in ineligible. They will not be able to be processed, but the parent shouldn't fear any of that because it's not checking that status. We're just checking for tax information. 
And so FSAID has created an option where they can do an FSAID to pull that information um, automatically. But if they do not provide any consent on the application, the student will be deemed ineligible. And I would like, also like to add, you know, since we're talking about the idea of consent, if a, if a family submits a paper FAFSA, whether they are um, the family members um, are undocumented or not, submitting a paper FAFSA implies consent. So they won't have to worry about not having given their consent if they submit a paper FAFSA. And we have another question here from Sandra. I'm going to move on and allow you to ask your question now, Sandra. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I had this example from a, a meeting this morning with one of my students. She wants to com complete the FAFSA, but the parent does not want to provide information. How do we proceed? So right now with the new FAFSA, um, that student would be ineligible um, for any aid without the parent providing consent. Um, now, they can submit it and enter the information manually, and when it comes to the school, it will be a rejected file, and maybe at the school, they can try to do a dependency override, but I'm, I'm unsure of those territories with this new application. Thank you. Uh -huh. I see a question here um, as I'm scanning over the Q&A. Um, someone is asking for clarifications on the, the assets piece. If a parent has $60,000 in assets, do they have to provide that information? Um, yes, you should provide whatever your assets is. It's not pulling that information from the IRS. Um, that is a question that you have to self-identify. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm just, um, are you, if you're able to see the chat too, Dr. Weathers, feel free to jump in on any of these questions that haven't been answered yet. I did have a question or a raise hand from Carol. So I'm going to allow Carol to take the floor while we scan through those questions. Carol, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Oh, I thought I did unmute. Oh, can okay. you hear me now? Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I have a student whose parent cannot have any contact with her. So she's 18, I'm getting ready to graduate, but she says that the court has ordered her parent has nothing to do with her at all. I don't. So is she considered independent when she does her fast? Does she need anything from the parent? Any because she's not going to have any kind of tax information. I'm not, I'm not, I have to ask her if she's working. I'm not sure. So on the last couple of slides, when I, when the student gets to the unusual circumstance of the application, they would say yes to that question. And then it'll go to the financial aid office. And then she would do what's called a dependency override and turn in oh. her court documents. Okay. All right. Thank so you. no parent. Uh -huh. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, just scanning through these questions, folks, to see if there are others that need to be answered live. Penny, while you're looking through questions, is it okay mm -hmm. to go ahead and give an FSA update? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so thanks, folks, for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Weathers. You are amazing. That's a <laughs> lot of information to go in a short <laughs> amount of time. You are um, truly one of a kind. Mm -hmm. um, folks, we have been given some updates from FSA, so I just wanted to give you all a sense of timing. There was some confusion when they did their press release a couple of weeks ago. People started to think it said that their the FAFSA will open on December 31st. The to clarify, it will open by December 31st. So okay. there is a chance it could open sooner. Um, however, if FSA sees that there's errors or there's issues with it, they will take it down, which is why we are, for all intents and purposes, working under the assumption of a December 31st date at this point. Um, 
but you, there is a chance you could see it up before then. The other important thing for you all to know is FSA is moving to a phased in approach because we are in crunch time. So what that means is the, the first priority is to get the FSA application up so that you all can have your students complete it. Um, but the student records, what are called ICERs, what folks like Dr. Weathers and her counterparts use to determine financial aid award letters will not be available to them or us and currently until the end of January is what they are estimating. So what that means is um, there will be a delay in getting those awards out. Um, the student will not see a FAFSA submission summary right away. They will get an email confirming their FAFSA has been submitted if they're an early filer. Um, and, and our financial aid offices are going to be super varied. So please don't um, be reaching out to them asking again and again, because it, we're all going to be waiting for those um, student records. So the, the estimate is for those early awards, the financial aid offices will be getting those records towards the end of, of January. That is also true for us, which means um, those of you who rely on the Finish the FAFSA tool, um, as soon as those records become available, we will populate the Finish the FAFSA tool and you will begin to see your students and um, their FAFSA submission status. We will send out an email notice to all who have an account um, to let you know it has been populated. And um, so we will keep you up to date as soon as we know and we see the, the records, we will share that with you. It does also have implications for the FAFSA tracker. Currently, FSA is claiming they will not release the information that we use to populate the FAFSA tracker until April. We are exploring other options in terms of populating that to hopefully get it up up sooner than that, um, but wanted you all to at least have a sense of the timing of, of um, this phased approach that FSA is talking about. So happy to answer any questions if um, if you have any. Thanks. Jenny, turning it back to you. Yeah, awesome. I think we got through all the questions. Um, thank you all for your engagement. I know that this is Again, a highly anticipated FAFSA season. Uh, there are so many things that are changing. And I just encourage you all to stay with us throughout the next month or so. We're going to be sharing updates with you as we get them. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, we will be sharing the slides. We will be sharing the presentation with you all going forward. And so, um, again, thank you for spending your morning with us. We'll get that information to you as soon as possible. Thank you again to Dr. Weathers, and thank you again um, to all of our CFNC reps who were here with us this morning, furiously answering questions in the background. We really appreciate you all, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Bye.